So, okay, a lot there, incredible statistics from about the sanctions. First of all, I just want to say, um, to me, sanctions are an act of war. Do you believe that? I certainly believe that. And I think yeah. one thing that is really interesting, two of our non-resident fellows, uh, Aziz Rana and uh, Ashley Bala, wrote a fantastic piece pointing out that when it comes to war, we actually have a lot of laws of what you can and cannot do, including, for instance, it's not permitted to go and bomb a civilian infrastructure in a war. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. with sanctions, there's no rules. And sanctions overwhelmingly hit civilian infrastructure or civilians. Uh, in, yep. in fact, they do so far more than they actually hit the government. So right. in some ways, sanctions are worse and kill more people. Yep, absolutely. So, okay, the I, I want to get at the psychology, I guess, of the regime itself, the Iranian regime. So Rouhani, the previous leader, was considered to be a reformer. We could talk about what that means, right? What does it mean to be a reformer in Iran? Um, but they seem to have made a change of mind. And you're saying it's that's largely due to the sanctions. But is it entirely because of the sanctions? So they've moved from what's called a reformist position to a hard, what's now called a hard line position. And I want to talk about what those things mean. These are words that everyone, including you, uses, right? What, what does that mean? What does a reformer mean in the Iranian context? And what does a hardliner mean too? And then is it, it can't just be because of the sanctions, I, I would suppose, that they've decided to shift in this way. Uh, what, what is it that caused this other than the sanctions? And the big question, Trita, is what does this regime want? What does it want? So let's take uh, a step back. Yeah. Um, in my analysis, I actually don't see a shift. Okay. It, you know, the hardline base um, was there before. I mean, Raisi almost automatically gets 15 or so million votes because there is a very dedicated portion of the population that will vote in that direction. And I think that's also very important to keep in mind. I mean, we get this image in the West that, you know, there's a small clique ruling the country and then there's everyone else and everyone right. else is against them. This regime does not have a majority support in my estimation, but it does have a very dedicated minority support hmm. that regardless of what type of a hardline candidate you put out there, they roughly get about 15 to 18 million votes all the time. So they're there and they have that support. It's not that people shifted that much. There's a small shift. It's the West who believe that um, resolving those tensions would be the pathway towards integrating Iran into the world economy and improving their economic life. They stayed home because they had lost faith in that path because of what happened in the last couple of years and because of the manipulation. And let me just add one thing. Raiz, uh, 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 Rouhani got more votes in 2017 than he got in 2013. So it was very clear. He got the JCPOA, the economy was going the right direction. There were still some disappointments. People expected more because most of the growth that Iran experienced after the JCPOA was because they were selling oil not because it was like massive investment coming into the country and there was more of a, a broad scale growth of uh, their economy. It's just that was a huge influx of money because of the oil sales. So there was disappointment, but he still got more votes. So the votes go up and then they just absolutely crash down. And I think it's really difficult to explain that with anything else or at a minimum, you know, because the, the narrative in Washington was kind of odd. You know, we've been sanctioning this country more than any other country in history, but that apparently doesn't have no impact on how the politics of that country developed. That's just bizarre. It's even more bizarre, in my view, how when Rouhani was elected, people in Washington and in Brussels, by the way, were very quick without any evidence to suggest sanctions got Rouhani elected. The sanctions that the West had imposed in Iran had made people so unhappy that they went and voted for Rouhani. Had it not been for sanctions, the population would have been happy to continue to have four more years of Ahmadinejad. There was no evidence for that. But taking mm -hmm. credit for something good, that were, that's something we're good at. But, you know, taking responsibility for something quite hostile, uh, horrible, at mm -hmm. least in my view, really bad development. Certainly, we're not going to take credit. We're even going to ignore that. So then to your questions, what does it mean to be a hardliner? What does it mean to be a reformist? You know, there's, there's many different 
uh, variables here that need to be taken into account. First of all, the reformists call themselves reformers, Esla Talab um, mm. in, in Persian, which means that they want, they believe in the system, they believe in the revolution, but they believe that there needs to be reforms. Um, the system needs to be changed. It needs to be much more open. They're not as hardline when it comes to um, um, uh, social issues, for instance. Okay. Um, they believe, they tend to believe much more in the idea that there needs to be some way to find a modus vivendi with the West. On the hardline side, you have more traditional people who are more socially conservative. Um, economically, uh, at times it can be more protectionist. Uh, uh, one of the critiques against Rouhani, for instance, from a lot of people on the left, is that actually Rouhani was really pushing for a lot of neoliberal policies mm. economically in Iran. Mm. Um, and even though the reformists tend to have a left leaning, that's not necessarily the case any longer on their economic platform. Mm. Um, and, um, and the hardliners do tend to have a more deterministic view, or let me put it, a skeptical view of the West as a whole, in the sense that they do really view the United States as looking to uh, destroy Iran's uh, political system. They believe that they want to, um, uh, based on history, that uh, they have just a, a inherent hostility to Iran and to the Islamic Republic. And as a result, their willingness to take some risks when it comes mm -hmm. to negotiations, I think mm -hmm. are far less than it is on the reformist side. It's only during uh, when you have people like Rouhani there that there's been some agreements that have been signed. That may change now going forward. So what does this regime want? Well, look, this mm -hmm. regime is no different from many other regimes on one fundamental sense, which is they want survival. Mm -hmm. uh, and they put that ahead of a whole lot of other things, certainly the interest of the population as a whole. But is Iran, you know, an anti-status quo state in the sense that they're trying to fundamentally change the order in the region? Uh, I think Iran certainly as a revolutionary country in the 80s was that. But come 1990s, you can see that the Iranians were certainly challenging American hegemony uh, in the Middle East. But we, would, we did not any longer see that the Iranians were pursuing regime change in neighboring states in the manner that they had done in the 1980s. Okay. 1980s, the Iranians were the regime change country. They were trying to export their revolution oh. uh, and they failed miserably. Uh, the only times they had some degree of success was in very weak states such as in Lebanon. They succeeded in building movements that are now part of the Lebanese government, Hezbollah. Um, but even that is, is hardly... You know, it's, it's difficult to see that having been successful had it not been for a whole host of other issues, such as the Lebanese state's inherent weakness, the invasion of Israel, uh, of Lebanon in 1982, etc. Uh, but they tried in Iraq, they failed. They tried in Bahrain, they failed. Right. Come 1990s, they're shifting more towards the idea that they're going to make Iran Islamic revolution so successful that it will become uh, an inspiration to other states and others will seek to emulate it. That too has been a failure, <laughs> but at least it's not been the same degree of, you know, uh, active regime change that we saw in the 1980s. But there is one fundamental geopolitical element that I think, regardless of what regime you have in Iran, is going to be a massive factor that no regime will be able to ignore. And that is that the Iranians see themselves, whether it's this regime or whether it's the Shah's regime, as a historic um, uh, major power in the region. And as a result, they need to have a role and a political um, um, uh, recognition in the region that they for the last 40 years clearly have not had because of their own radicalism, because of their own policies. Um, they have been isolated and contained, treated as a pariah. And, you know, there's much in their behavior that probably justifies you know, laws of geopolitics doesn't necessarily take that into account. When you have a country that size, that powerful, even if its behavior is highly problematic, if you seek to isolate it, it tends to make the problem worse. And that is exactly what has happened in the mm -hmm. Iranian case. Mm -hmm. The more the United States has tried to isolate and exclude Iran 
from the legitimate avenues of economic and political influence in the region, the more the Iranians have pushed back and tried to make the policy of isolating Iran more costly for the United States. So it ends up becoming a vicious cycle. When they have tried to reach out and play a positive game, as they did in Afghanistan in 2001, they still got nothing for it. I mean, the Iranians were the ones who were essentially um, credited by the US side itself for succeeding and bringing all the different warring parties in Afghanistan together and come to an agreement on a new constitution for Afghanistan in 2001.